Okay, I'm here today with Jim Capek. He's the COO at the Westboro Country Club in uh, St. Louis. How are you doing today, Jim? Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to have you here. Uh, so, Jim, you know, one of the things uh, I, I always like to start with is just understanding a little bit more about you. I mean, you know, Chief, Chief Operating Officer for, for an outstanding country club. How did you end up here? Well, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, I, was, uh, I actually started in country club, working in country clubs at 15 years old. And I've worked in country clubs ever since. And, uh, um, you know, that's 40, 45, uh, 45 years. Um, you know, so I worked at country clubs all through high school, all through college. Um, got out of college and thought I was going to go a little bit different direction. And the uh, general manager uh, at the time said, hey, you know, if you want to make a living out of this, I think you could be really successful. And uh, I took his advice. And, uh, you know, not, uh, not all that long later, when I was 28, I was the... Uh, I uh, got a general manager's job at, at the Elgin Country Club, um, northwest of Chicago, um, and then uh, stayed at that job for 26 years uh, before I came down here to St. Louis uh, five and a half years ago. Uh, and I've just absolutely loved the transition. Um, just just love coming from up there and down here, and uh, it's been it's been great. Well, that's outstanding. I, you know, I think we've all had that person who was like, hey, you know, you could make a career out of this and uh, you always have to appreciate that person. And uh, it's always great to see, you know, 40 years later when it definitely worked out for you. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, can you tell me a little bit about the Westboro country club now? Cause I mean, it's a uh, absolutely gorgeous facility. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. I'm sure, I'm sure the listeners would as well. Sure. So we're a, uh, we're a private member owned country club. And uh, so we currently have uh uh, 435 golf members, families, and uh, we have another 100 uh, social members that uh, can do everything else but use the golf course. Um, and uh, we are uh, we're very young membership, very fun membership. I always describe the membership itself as uh, very uh, authentic, you know, very unpretentious, uh, not your stereotypical country club, uh, you know. And uh, they certainly embrace the uh, employees, and uh, um, you know it's 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 really a great uh, it's a community, you know it really is a, a community. Uh, um, I've I've toyed around with uh, taking the name Country Club out of our name, and just calling ourselves Westboro, um, because I, the connotation of Country Club to me is sometimes a little uh, uh, doesn't match up as much with uh, with who we are. Um, uh, but our, you know, from a facility standpoint, we've got a uh, we've got a clubhouse that uh, we have uh, within the last several years have uh, remodeled everything. Um, we uh, uh, have a golf course that we've uh, uh, continuing continuing to uh, uh, upgrade all the time. Um, we've we spent uh, probably four million dollars on the golf course uh, since I've got here, um, and. Uh, uh, we, we still have plans to, to keep going and uh, really, uh, really make it or you know, uh, improve the gem, improve the gem uh, that it is. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, we have four uh, hydro clay tennis courts and a very active uh, tennis program, particularly with the kids. Um, and uh, then we have a fitness center. And that's one of the things that um, compared to many of the local clubs, Gives us a little bit of a little bit of advantage, and uh, that uh, you know some of them might have a, a little bit of a weight room or kind of a fitness center like a hotel. Ours is a you know very very complete fitness center with uh, group exercise rooms, and we have uh, a lot of classes and personal trainers and masseuse and uh, everything. So it's uh, you know really fits in well with uh, with our. Uh, uh, and the funny thing is, you know, like like many places that build fitness fitness centers. Uh, at the time, they wanted to do it because we had so many young people, but it gets used just as much by the by the older folks. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so you mentioned you have a, a younger client, uh, a younger membership. Uh, so, uh, you know, take me through what is a younger membership? Like, what is what what was the membership at? You know, and maybe in your last country club or or when you got to this country club, and and where are they at now? So, the last country club I was at, the average age was about fifty five. And uh, for that area, that was actually considered a relatively young, uh, young club. Um, but uh, this club, if you would go back to like 2003 and uh, you look at uh, the, uh, uh, the average age back then was uh, 
59 years old. And okay. you know, I look at all the I look at all the old uh, newsletters from from back then and from many years beyond that, before that, and you know, just look at the pictures and you really see that you know, wow, everybody was was pretty old. And and uh, um, as the club came on some uh, tougher economic times in the in the uh, in the late uh, well, the early like around 2008, 2009, right. when the economy economy kind of tanked. Um, club was in a, it was kind of in a really tough uh, financial position. Um, they had just built the fitness center, so they took on a lot of debt. And, uh, you know, and then, <laughs> and then they, you know, people were resigning and then it got exp more expensive for everybody else and more were resigning. And so, you know, that uh, uh, at that point, the, uh, the board, you know, and the uh, prior management, you know, had the wisdom to uh, try to initiate some programs to enhance, to entice younger families to, to, to join the club. And, you know, I give them all the credit in the world for, uh, for the programs that they put in, um, uh, you know, with a staged membership level. So your dues were based on what your age was up until age uh, 40. Um, and uh, so each year your dues would kick, you know, just kick up a little bit. And it made it affordable for for some of the younger people to join, and it's really what started the the uh, you know transition to to where we are now. Um, so uh, when I started, you know, I think the uh, the average age was still uh, was still around 40, 48 or forty or forty nine or fifty, and uh, at this point now we're down to to uh, uh, eight, average age of forty five. Uh, which I think is just absolutely unheard of in, in clubs that I know of anyway. We've had over 200 members that are under uh, golf members that are under 40 years old. And uh, we have 100 social members. And I would guess, uh, you know, probably 75% of them are you know, in their early 40s or under. Uh, and, and so many kids. I mean, <laughs> wow. That, 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 is a, that is not at all what I think of when I think of country clubs is, is to have, you know, 45 and under and, and, you know, uh, ki kids running around and, and uh, that's, that's absolutely incredible. So, so, so how, I mean, I'm sure everybody wants to know, like, how did you get there? Right? Like, how, how did you get to a point where you, where you, you brought the overall age down and, and I, I guess as a follow up to that is, you know, it, it, how does that mesh with your, with your traditional members? I mean, so how did you get there and how did that mesh? Well, you know, one of the things that, that we did was uh, um, we got some of these. So we got some of the younger members just based on making it more affordable. Okay. Um, and so that kind of started a base, um, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't it didn't really boom until we had sat down with, you know, all the members and and with some focus groups and kind of got a feel for what they were looking for in the club. And um uh, so we, we started that process about five years ago. And uh, um, so then we put, we put those ideas into action and uh, um, we got them to approve an assessment to uh, revamp the facilities. You know, so here we, we already had a somewhat younger membership, but the facilities that we had were really very, very dated. You know, they weren't, uh, they weren't conducive to what members would like. We had some we had some rules and, and dress codes that were a little outdated, and and uh, uh, so you know we made we made some of those changes. And really, once we once we made a wholesale uh, approval to to commit to, to commit to this and commit to the programming for the for the younger families, and uh, uh, from the very time we did the drawings of what we what we wanted to do with the clubhouse, it just created a buzz. And we had a hundred new families join within a 12 month period of that, of that, uh, uh, of that approval uh, before it was before, you know, and, and half of that was before it was ever actually constructed. Um, and so, you know, then once we had, then once we had them, you know, and they were, and they had that buzz, it really became a kind of a, uh, you know, a, a perpetuating culture that, you know, they're bringing their friends in. Because they're, you know, and so prior, prior, and the, the other thing that had happened, um, you know, when we built, we built, uh, we built this uh, restaurant that we called Bendelos, and it was uh, uh, named Bendelos after the um, uh, original golf course architect, which was Tom Bendelow back in 1907. So we wanted to keep a little bit of our heritage, but we we built it with a, a 
a younger mindset uh, in mind. So it doesn't look anything like you'll see it at any other country club. It's, you know, it's got the uh, industrial ceilings, uh, with the exposed ductwork and, and, and that, um, a 360 bar. Um, and it just promotes kind of the young, fun community um, that we didn't really have before. Uh, one of the things we see since we built that restaurant was a lot of ladies come into the bars, uh, to the bar, you know, with other, with other ladies, um, other women. Um, whereas uh, before, the only people that went to our bar was the, was the guys after a round of golf, have a drink, go away. You know, this now is like a whole daytime. You want to go meet somebody, let's go up to Bendelos. Let's go to Bendelos, you know, or just by themselves. Go to Bendelos because somebody's going to be there that you're going to start talking to. And, and so it's really kind of been our center, the center of our, uh, our community. Um, and then the other thing that, the other thing that, that has come along with that is the, um, uh, the fact that we really embrace the kids, you know, and so we don't just talk about, you know, hey, we're family friendly. We really have a lot of programming that is just aimed at the kids. So, you know, this morning I look out of the putting green and there's the entire putting green is circled with, with junior golf bags. And uh, um, we have 200, we have 216 kids in junior golf. Wow. 216 kids every Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. And they, they do lessons on the putting green and the short game area and the, in the driving uh, area. And then they, um, uh, uh, and then on Fridays, they, they have the course until, until noon. Um, so 216 kids in that at the same time, we have 260 kids on the swim team. So they're, they're going in and out to swim uh, practice at the different age groups. Um, so some of them are going from junior golf and then they got their swim and then they got their tennis, 316 kids in tennis. And, and then uh, we have 170 of those, of those kids, 170 of them are in our program with uh, like camp counselors and that, that take them to the various, you know, that spend, spend an hour with them inside and then take them to their tennis lesson and then, you know, take inside and then take them to their swim lesson. And, and so we got, you know, somebody that's, that uh, has to arrange all that. Uh, um, and I am like, so glad that's not part of my job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Diane, I just love her because <laughs> I don't know how she does it. And, uh, but we have, and, and we really have, you know, instructors that, that truly embrace the kids and, and love the kids. Um, and then the, um, the other thing we, we just did um, that I think is going to make us uh, uh, even more popular uh, throughout the winter is we just did a whole uh, uh, remodel of our uh, entire uh, golf shop. And uh, so within the golf, so we, we modernized it, but right in the golf shop, right next to the, the pro shop counter are two uh, full swing hit simulator bays. Oh, nice. And so, uh, you know, and again, a lot of clubs are, a lot of clubs are putting those in and that, but we put a, we put it right in the golf shop. And, uh, so it's right there. It's right there. It's got a lounge. It's got a lounge with it. We serve them food there, beverages there. And so the, our golf shop now has all the kind of sudden become a, a destination. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, just a few statistics, the, since we built, since we built Bendelow's, um, our member spending, um, in the restaurant for, uh, food and beverages increased by 75%. Yeah. Wow. That is yeah, a huge 70, number. 75%. And so the pro shop's only been open two months, but the, the, uh, merchandise sales has doubled, um, you know, of, of those same two months from previous years. So, uh, um, you know, we're, we're building it and they're coming. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's funny because you talked about, you know, surveying a lot of the members and seeing what it is they were interested in, uh, you know, that process right there. I mean, that had to kind of set the tone for, uh, you know, for, for what was to come, right. I mean, cause you had to do special assessments in order to get the funding in order to be able to do this. Um, you know, talk to me about the adoption of your members, right? Because you've, you've, taking the, the age down, you've got kids running around 360 kids doing tennis or whatever that number was. And, uh, you know, you've got a brand new restaurant. How does this, how has this adoption process gone with your, with your members? Um, fantastic. You know, and it's, it's, um, 
It's been not not that, not that there's not uh, you know a couple dissenters that wouldn't love it to love to see it uh, you know and say you know hey I'd rather just spend more money and have the golf course all to myself you know and, <laughs> you know <laughs> there's always, always a few of those and uh, uh, until they actually find out how much it would be but uh, <laughs> uh, so it's it's really been very very well embraced you know and and uh, again just this morning as I was saying I, I was looking at all those golf bags around the uh, Hunting Green, we had a couple of the old senior members that, that play early in the morning, and they're just like, you know, Jim, this is this is the greatest thing. This is the greatest thing we've we've seen. You know, to to see these young kids out here and that, and so I, I think that's that really, you know, was is one of the things that that has helped this because we still obviously we still do have you know members that have been around here a long time, and and they've embraced it, and I think that you know part of that was the the way we went about it with these focus groups. And telling them what you know, telling them what the prognosis of the clubs were, and, th- and some of that started before me. Um, but you know, letting them know what the prognosis for the club would be if we didn't embrace the the youth, you know, because because the there are other clubs in this area that that people can. I mean, there's a club right down the street, two blocks away, um, wow. that that people can join that have you know a little bit different culture, um, that definitely not as young. Uh, a little more expensive um, and uh, you know they 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 could go down the street if they wanted but they realized what it that what it was going to take to make this club different than that club and and successful that's awesome so you know whenever you take that voice of the customer right regardless of where you get it from i mean once you take that voice of the customer you create that buy in which is you know which is absolutely key uh it sounds like they love what you're doing you know, how does that, how does that buy in and how does that, that listening to the customer and that transformation, how does that like push out to the team? I mean, is your team just as on fire as, as you are about some of this stuff? Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, they were, they were a big part of that. Uh, they were a big part of that as well. Um, you know, while we certainly found out what the, uh, what the members wanted uh, we also, you know, listen to our employees and what the employees need. So, you know, um, again, I, I, I've been in the business a long time and have a, a ton of experience and, and think I know, you know, think I know a lot, but, uh, you know, when it came to, um, you know, renovating the kitchen and renovating the bar and, and that, you know, we certainly went right to the frontline staff um, to make sure that they were involved in the plans for, you know, for the, uh, um, for the renovations. Um, so they could decide how it would operate, you know, uh, um, and that was another, that was another, uh, really key thing that, uh, that we had to do in order to, uh, make this renovation work. Had we, had we renovated the, and built the restaurant, if we built Bendelow's and we didn't improve the kitchen, we'd have been dead in the water. We'd had, we'd have had a beautiful facility that people used for a year. And then, eh, you know what, the service ain't great. The food's not great, you know. But we had brought in, uh, we brought in a chef that I had worked with for. Uh, uh, he was my assistant chef at the last club for 14 years, and uh, you know I just knew that he was the perfect fit for out here, and uh, you know I was going to do whatever we needed to do to get him to to come come down here, and uh, uh, so he came down here. He brought another person from from that club um, down here. Um, and uh, I actually had another assistant manager from from up there that followed me down here. Um, yeah, they weren't real happy with me. <laughs> I, I was going to say, so you got that phone call from your replacement saying, "Hey, whoa, what's hey, going on here?" Right? Knock it off. No, I've got a really great relationship with them. Uh, actually, it's still up there. But well, that's uh, good. It's um, still there. That's good. Yes, it, it absolutely. Um, but uh, um, you know, so they they all. Uh, Kind of knew what I wanted, but they also they also were very instrumental in making sure that once we built these facilities, they would have the they would have the tools necessary to service the members, and uh, because that's been a huge part of it. I mean, our members love our food. You know, I've never I've never been in a club where I, I can't even tell you what the percentage is uh, of of members. That, I mean, there's it's so few and far between when I ever have a a complaint about the food and and. And it and it's the buzz throughout other clubs in this area too. I mean, you get members from other clubs are like, "Oh my God, I hear your food's great," you know, stuff. So, 
So that's been awesome. a that's been a key that's been a key uh, factor as well, you know. And I think uh, uh, I think sometimes that's really overlooked in country clubs um, of, of just how good that that needs to be and the quality and the freshness um, because you think that oh, it's it's all about golf, right? You know, if you got a great golf course, that's you know that's all. And, they, and you know, we our golf course is is uh, is very very good, but you know, there's there's of course better there's better golf courses out there you know always and, and uh um but you know again people stay here because of that culture and and i think actually the food and beverage service experience is really is really a part of is a big part of that here uh you know our uh, our uh, uh, net provider scores you know i think the benchmark in clubs is around 65 and ours are typically you know 89 uh wow so, well, you know, I can tell you that, uh, you know, that culture you've built of, of you know, active listening, buy-in, uh, inclusion, I think that's, you know, it, it's a little bit of that secret sauce that everybody talks about, right? You know, how do you get people to stay? How do you keep uh, your members engaged? How do you keep, you know, clients engaged, your team engaged? You know, I think you got it, right? You know, it's listen to them. It's when they tell you something, do it. And, uh, you know, you set the vision and, and, and have everybody come with you. Yeah, and you know, and uh, having that, having the Bendelos uh, uh, project be so successful, and and it made the club, you know, obviously with more members and more food and beverage revenue, you know, we became much more, we became much more profitable. So it used to be, you know, several years ago. I mean, uh, you know, uh, up until a few years ago, at the end of every year, there'd be a you know thirteen hundred dollar, fifteen hundred dollar. Um, operating assessment to make up for the operating losses, you know, and uh, two years ago, we had that down to $150. Um, last year, it was zero. Uh, this year, it'll be zero. Um, and, uh, you know, and that, I think that gave us a lot of credibility to, um, to go to the members. And so when we went to the members now for this last renovation to do, uh, uh, we're redoing all the uh, bunkers. Um, and, uh, so, uh, you know, all of a sudden, when you go to membership with a project like that, if you've gotten rid of your operating assessment and you had a lot of credibility from their last capital assessment, you know, and the votes just overwhelmingly, yes, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, there's, there's not even a lot of question anymore because they really, they really believe in us uh, that we're going to do it right. That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. So, you know, you clearly got a lot of experience. You've got a great vision. You know, you know what you're, you know what you're aiming for here. Uh, you know, I always like to leave our, uh, you know, leave our listeners with kind of that piece of advice on on what you would say or or what you would do uh, uh, for future leaders that are coming in. So, you know, given your culture, given your background, given what you do, what kind of advice would you give to future leaders uh, that are coming into the hospitality space? you know, especially, you know, uh, surrounding your operation? Sure. Um, well, you know, one of my, I tell you, my personal mission statement is to enhance the lives of the members and the employees. And if you can find in satisfaction in that, then it's a wonderful business to be in. And, if, you know, if you, if you can get true satisfaction in your heart by making people happy, um, then, this, then it's a great business. But I would tell you, if not, it's way too much work and don't do it. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, it's kind of, that's kind of one thing, but, uh, uh, the other thing that I would give, you know, the advice to, uh, uh, younger managers coming in is, is that, you know, you definitely need to change your, change your attitudes with, with the times too. You know, I mean, uh, um, I, if I was running the, this country club, the same way I ran, the other country club 20 years ago, you know, we wouldn't be successful. Um, you know, there's, there's things that you need to ad ad adopt to that are just cultural culturally need to need to, to, to change with, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the industry. Um, and so it is, it is nothing for me to, you know, work, uh, some ungodly amount of hours every week. Um, but I think that I, I do not expect that of the employees that work for me um because right. i think the times have changed and you know and people have a different sense of uh work-life balance and uh you know i think there are there are still uh, 
uh, there are still some colleagues of mine, you know, that that believe, hey, this is how we grew up, you know, we got to make we got to make them go through it, right? You know, this is the initiation. That's your that's what you got to do to get there, you know. And uh, and I just don't think that's a, that's a realistic view uh, of uh, management anymore. And uh, you know, uh, I guess the other you know the other the advice I would I would give was just to be just to be uh, authentic and honest with your employees and and. Uh, uh, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I, I ever got was, you know, Jim, the business, it's just about the members and the employees. You know, it's uh, the numbers will fix themselves. You know, it's about the members and the employees. You know, in this last uh, this last winter, we just sent uh, uh, all our full time uh, service staff, bartenders, service staff and uh, one of the managers, um, sent them all to uh, Paso Robles, California, out to a winery out there. They rented a, we rented a, uh, a house in, on a vineyard. They all stayed in the same house um, and, uh, you know, spent uh, five days out there with, you know, really great wine dinners and, and stuff with the, with the owners of different wineries and, and the winemakers. And, you know, they came back and, and it was the neatest thing, the neatest thing that they came back and uh, my, uh, my assistant general manager who had, who had gone with them, um, uh, she said, you know, I, I can't imagine spending five days, 24 hours a day with people I work with, and it had been so easy. It's like, you know, it was wow. just so easy that we all just got along so well. And, you know, and so uh, um, taking care of your employees and they'll take care, they'll take care of you. They'll take care of your members. That is, that is outstanding. Uh, you know, so I uh, definitely will be putting in an application. Uh, I'd love to go <laughs> on the, on the uh, Paso Roble trip uh, next time you guys do that. I'm a huge wine country fan. Uh, no, that's outstanding. I, I think you, uh, you know, you're hitting on all cylinders right now. Your membership is proving it out. One of the things that blew my mind uh, when we were talking earlier, you got two and a half year wait list or something like that to be able to get into the club. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's funny because you talk to prospective members and they want to get in and, and then you just tell them about the wait lists and they're like, oh my God, are you kidding? And then, and then, they're, you know, then they kind of go and think about it and then they come back and they're like, well, you know, there must be a reason. <laughs> That's awesome. That, that so, is awesome. So it's, yeah, the wait list is continuing, continuing to grow. <laughs> well, if people wanted to find out more about the Westboro Country Club and possibly hop on that wait list uh, uh, for when their kids graduate high school, uh, you know, <laughs> what's the best way to, to, to look up uh, Westboro Country Club? Well, if you're just looking for for technical information, our website, you know, westbrocc.com is is great. But uh, if you want to see more about how much uh, how much fun we have, uh, Instagram is uh, is the best place. We're uh, very active in social media. Um, you see a lot of uh, you see a lot of uh, who we are. I think on Instagram says uh, says a lot better more than our kind of scripted website. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate the time today, Jim. This was a, a, a great conversation. Congratulations on all your success and the success you've seen in there at the club. Absolutely wonderful. And hopefully we'll get a chance to connect again in the future. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right. Talk to you soon, Jim.